Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. My name is David Balton. I am a senior fellow here at the Woodrow Wilson Center in the Polar Institute. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today for our event on infrastructure in the Arctic, building for tomorrow. We're so pleased to partner with our friends on the US Committee for the Marine Transportation System, a committee with which I worked rather a lot in a former life I had at the US Department of State. The Arctic is changing. Much of this change, of course, is driven by a warming climate. The Arctic is warming on average more than twice as fast as the rest of the planet. And this is having profound consequences, not only for the people who live in the Arctic, but at least potentially for the rest of us, too. And with a warming climate, we have already seen an increase in certain types of human activities in the Arctic, certain types of shipping, tourism, potential additional oil and gas development, potential changes in fishing patterns and operations. Other nations in the Arctic, particularly Russia, are investing heavily in infrastructure to position themselves for the Arctic of the future, which raises the question, what ought we to be doing here in the United States? What sorts of infrastructure ought we to be investing in? And we have a most distinguished panel of people to address that and related questions for you. I will join them at the end during a question and answer period. But at this point, it's my pleasure <laughs> to turn over the microphone to my friend and colleague, Helen Broll, Executive Director of the CMTS. As Jim Kirk would say, Helen, you have the con. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Ambassador Bolton, for the opening remarks. Um, Dave has always said throughout the time that I've known him, please, Helen, call me Dave. But I love to call him Ambassador Bolton, um, partly because it sounds cool, and secondly, because um, he is certainly due the respect um, for his extraordinary career supporting Arctic interests for the United States. I um, want to thank also the Wilson Center Polar Initiative um, for joining us and allowing us really to join them on this critical issues in U.S. Arctic. Um, we have, uh, this may be the fourth uh, joint event um, with the CMTS, but also we really appreciate the expertise that we've been able to draw upon um, for our day-to-day -day, um, interests. The U.S. Committee on the Marine Transportation System, or CMTS, is a cabinet level federal interagency committee. It's really an interagency policy coordinating committee for the purpose of assessing the adequacy of the Marine Transportation System, or MTS, promoting the integration of marine transportation with other modes of transportation, including with um, interests in the environment, and making recommendations with regard to uh, federal policies that impact the marine transportation system. There are over 45, fed, excuse me, 45, 25 federal agencies uh, in the U.S. government that are related to MTS and are members of the CMTS. So uh, people often ask, um, why is there a CMTS? And I think the, the best way that I can explain it is that if someone asked me a question about, well, who is managing maritime transportation in the federal government, I would have to ask them, well, what's the question? So if you want to know about charting and mapping, you'd go to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. If you wanted to talk about who regulates our waterways, you'd go to the U.S. Coast Guard. Who dredges, manages our locks and dams? That would be the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And who educates our mariners? That would be the Maritime Administration. Who regulates our maritime um, in, in some respects? That's the maritime, Federal Maritime Commission. Now, those are just a few of the 25 agencies that have an interest in the marine transportation system, but those agencies I mentioned are either independent or in different departments. So imagine trying to bring all of those folks together to talk about mutual interests to support our MTS, and that's what the CMTS does. This is our fifth year that the CMTS has been engaged in National Infrastructure Week. It highlights the importance of maritime infrastructure for our nation's economy, <coughs> for safety and security. The CMTS interest is, of course, about maritime infrastructure. 
Um, it's a, Infrastructure Week is a collaborative effort, effort by businesses, civic groups, organizations, and other infrastructure stakeholders to bring awareness to the importance of infrastructure to our nation. The CMTS has an active interagency committee on infrastructure investment. It was established to facilitate the development of broad evaluation and decision criteria that can be used across the government uh, programs for informing federal infrastructure decision making and investment. So our infrastructure, Maritime Infrastructure Investment Integrated Action Team organized this event, and thank you to Jaya Ghosh um, who set it up for us today. One of the uh, most popular downloads from the CMTS actually came from the Infrastructure Investment Team. It is a federal funding handbook, which is a compendium of federal funding opportunities that can be applied to the maritime transportation. Now, maybe they weren't intended for maritime, um, but the, some are, and then, but some that weren't intended for maritime actually could be used for maritime. So it's very popular because it tells you um, about over 80 different federal funding programs in the U.S., or excuse me, in the federal government. We also have an Arctic Maritime Transportation Integrated Action Team that handles much of our Arctic interests. In 2010, the CMTS was directed in statute to coordinate domestic transportation policy for safety and security. In response, we established this interagency, Arctic interagency team, which is led by the Maritime Administration, by U.S. Coast Guard, and by NOAA. The team has worked towards ensuring a safe and efficient MTS in the U.S. Arctic and has developed the following resources on the topic. And I want to bring them to your attention because um, if you're new to the subject, or you want to um, steal some good verbiage on what maritime transportation system is like in the U.S. Arctic. They're great documents. Just recently in December, Sarah to my left uh, uh, um, updated, and it was published, a, a, uh, a review, an update on near-term recommendations to prioritize infrastructure needs in the U.S. Arctic, and that was just issued in December. So infrastructure investment, as you know, is vital for economic growth and prosperity in the Arctic. This report provides an update on the 25 near-term recommendations provided in a 2016 report called A 10-Year Prioritization of Infrastructure Needs in the U.S. Arctic and provides a status update on the current state of MTS infrastructure in the region. I highly recommend it for a compendium of different infrastructure, uh, the state of uh, various maritime transportation infrastructure in the U.S. Arctic. Also, you may be interested in a report that we issued in 2017, recommendations and criteria, criteria for using federal public-private partnerships to support critical U.S. Arctic maritime infrastructure. P3s represent a promising approach, but complicated, that can leverage the strengths of private and public sex, uh, sectors to expand and improve Arctic infrastructure. There are 19 recommendations that can be used to help guide the planning process for federal departments and agencies as well for communities and industry who are interested in exploring the possibility of P3s in the Arctic. Um, you'll also hear from uh, Sarah Harrison today, who is with the CMTS, about our ongoing project to, um, to update a report on vessel projections in the U.S. Arctic through 2030. Since our inception 14 years ago, the <laughs> CMTS has driven to improve coordination across agencies responsible for the U.S. marine transportation system. And we believe that we've enabled our federal partners to work towards that mission. It has always been vital to keep our stakeholders informed, and we hope that today's panel as part of Infrastructure Week and for future events like this will provide to all of you an opportunity to better understand the work of the CMTS and to better understand the value of our marine transportation system. The format today um, is, to, is a kind of living room style, even though we're not in easy chairs. Um, I'm going to provide just short, brief um, introductions for all of our panelists um, up front. Uh, there are extended um, bios both outside and online. Uh, afterwards, we're going to open up for uh, Q&A. I will start the question and answer period, uh, ask some questions to get us going, after which we will open it up to the audience. Um, and during the Q&A, as uh, Dave Bolton said, he will join us up here, so you can, you can pelt him with uh, questions as well. Without further ado. Um, first uh, presenter today is Ms. Sarah Harrison. 
She is a senior Arctic specialist with the CMTS. She's leading an Arctic maritime transportation stakeholder team to project maritime vessel activity trends in the U.S. Arctic out to 2030. She first joined the CMTS as a 2018 NOAA Sea Grant Canouse Fellow, uh, managing the Arctic and science and technology interagency teams. She has an MS in Marine Sciences from the University of Georgia, where she studied biogeochemical fate of oil in the marine environment. Secondly is Ms. Sherry Goodman. She is a former U.S. Deputy Undersecretary of Defense seen and is currently a senior fellow with the Wilson Center Polar Initiative. She's an experienced leader, lawyer, and director in the fields of national security, energy, science, oceans, and environment. Ms. Goodman served as the first Deputy Undersecretary of Defense um, under environmental security from 1993 to 2001. And Sherry also served as a senior vice president and general counsel of the Center for Naval Analysis, hmm. where she was also founder and executive director of the CNA Military Advisory Board. The uh, mayor just went, mm. yes, <laughs> pretty impressive. Yes. Third, we have um, Mr. Jeff San Juan. He is, uh, serves as the senior infrastructure development finance officer for ADA, which stands for the Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority. Jeff manages the operations and projects for the Infrastructure Development Division. The division is responsible for direct lending, public-private partnerships, uh -huh. um, NMTC, which you told me about, but I'm going to let you talk about it again, and special projects from the Alaska Legislature. He has over 15 years in finance and banking. Lastly is the Honorable Richard Benville. Richard Benville is a proud resident of, of 30 years of Nome and its mayor. Richard um, also serves as a board member of the Alaska State Chamber of Commerce and vice president of the Nome Chamber of Commerce. Just vice president, Mr. Mayor? 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> the Bering Strait Leadership Committee, the Nome Community Center, and Nome Arts Council. The mayor is also an active member in the Alaska travel industry and um, association and founder of Nome Discovery Tours, also in its 30th year. In November, he will assume the chairmanship of Alaska's Municipal Leagues of Alaska's Mayor's Association. And he considers the high Arctic his home. So without further ado, uh, we'll ask each of our, our panelists to provide just eight to 10 minutes, broad um, overview of their work and interests in the US Arctic. Um, please feel free to go either to the podium or sit at your seats, after which we'll have a Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Jaya, with the slides. Perfect. Thank you so much. And good morning, everybody, and happy Infrastructure Week. Um, my name is Sarah Harrison, as Helen just mentioned, um, and I am working with the CMTS uh, to project how vessel traffic uh, is expected to change over the next decade out to the year 2030. The CMTS be first became engaged in projecting vessel activity back in 2015 with the publication of a 10-year projection study of maritime activity in the U.S. Arctic, which is available on our website, cmts.gov. Um, this was a report to the White House as part of the National Strategy for the Arctic Region. And the document used vessel activity as measured by AIS data, uh, together with estimates of vessel activity associated with offshore oil and gas exploration and global economic, uh, economic and global shipping forecast to estimate vessel activity out to, 25, to 2025. Since the release of the report in 2015, however, a lot has changed, en enough such that's prompted us to reconsider the assumptions used to develop the first report. For example, in 2015, Shell withdrew from the Chukchi Sea, taking with it all of that uh, excess uh, vessel activity associated with oil and gas um, up there, offshore oil and gas. Additionally, the growth of, uh, of traffic associated with research and tourism has outpaced our expectations outlined in the first report. So, um, so we're working to update this report and deliver it by the end of the fiscal year 2019 with a draft out for public comment next month. And before I dive into the details about some of vessel activity, I just want to acquaint us with where I'm talking about when I refer to the Arctic, um, because there are many different ways to define this very special space. Um, so the U.S. legally defines the Arctic as the region north of the red, but very much black line, as you guys can see here. Um, so it's, it's the land and water north of the Aleutians um, all the way across the top. Um, 
The IMO, the International Maritime Organization, on the other hand, defines polar, uh, through its polar code, recognizes waters 60 degrees and north as Arctic. And for our purposes uh, for this report, we're utilizing the IMO's definition of Arctic waters rather than the legal U.S. definition. Um, and as you can see, though this area that's uh, shaded in the box, um, this shaded box here, includes waters within the U.S. exclusive economic zone as well as waters beyond, because we understand that what happens in our neighbors' waters may impact traffic in our own waters. Um, and we're also looking at vessel traffic uh, very, very broadly. You'll notice I'm not using the word Arctic shipping exclusively. Um, and I promise that eight to 10 minutes is not nearly enough time to discuss all the different flavors, but I'm gonna try and give you a few highlights. So first off, no talk about projections about the future of the Arctic is complete without thinking about the region's vast natural resources. And historically, Arctic shipping has largely been in reference to the transportation of natural resources from the Arctic to the world's global markets. Today, in, within our area of interest, operates the world's largest zinc mine, the Red Dog Mine near Kivalina, which um, Mr. San Juan can speak more about. Um, and it utilizes 23 to 27 bulk carriers annually to move ore during its short shipping season, typically early July to mid-October. And while we don't anticipate this activity related to Red Dog to change, all it takes is the discovery of new resources nearby that can utilize existing infrastructure to deliver more goods to, or more uh, minerals to the market. So for example, if uh, minerals found at the nearby uh, spot called Leak um, are, are harvested in the next decade, that could increase the level of vessels from uh, by seven or eight, five to eight uh, bulk carriers annually. And of course, beyond our area of interest, Russia has been developing natural uh, LNG infrastructure on the Yamal Peninsula and proposed to build a second facility on the Gaidan Peninsula with the intent to ship LNG from these facilities year round. We anticipate that the outgrowth of infrastructure several thousands of miles away has the potential to greatly impact vessel activity in our region of interest. As LNG tankers working to ship fuel from Russia to Asian markets must pass through the Bering Strait and through our area of interest. And so if eastbound shipments are done only in summer months with the 15 LNG icebreaking tankers that they have ordered, that could contribute to up to three dozen transits in a single year through this area as soon as 2021. But there's more to the Arctic than just its natural resources. There are the communities that live there. And um, given the thing, uh, and, and so it's also about shipping to the Arctic, supplying the communities and supplying the industries that call the Arctic home. And I want to focus on just one type of traffic, one that has an interesting relationship to its landside infrastructure, given the theme of this week. So it's going to my next slide. Um, of the 45 power plants in western and northern Alaska, all but three are powered by petroleum or, or liquid uh, 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 fuel. On the map of this region, you can see these uh, our locations are all in the white uh, circles. Uh, representing each of these petroleum powered stations. The three outliers are all powered by natural gas and all lie in close proximity to the North Slope where oil and gas activities are centered in the state. Makes sense. You'll also notice that creeping through the center of the state in this white line is um, other infrastructure, namely some, one of the state's most famous pieces of infrastructure, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, moving oil from the North Slope down to facilities in the South. So how do the communities that live in western and northern Alaska who don't have access to roads or pipelines receive their fuel? It comes by ship. And on the map, you'll notice these small little blue icons. Um, and these are places where large tankers are known <coughs> to anchor offshore and lighter their load to smaller ships that then deliver fuel to these small communities, smaller communities. And while we anticipate the energy, the demand for energy uh, to grow as the population grows in the next decade, the adoption of renewable energy sources, such as wind turbines, including some that have been funded by the Department of Energy and other organizations, may alter the traffic pattern associated with these uh, tanker and, and fuel delivery systems. 
And of course, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about uh, vessels to and from the Arctic without mentioning vessels going through the Arctic. And this is perhaps the piece of traffic that is, has people the most anxious. Um, and as sea ice melts sooner and refreezes later, there is a, um, more and more opportunity for ships to move through the Arctic. Um, and if you look at this next slide, you've seen this before, and you have the three passage, uh, three, three ways of, of transporting. So you can go through the northern sea route, um, you can go uh, through the Northwest Passage, or someday uh, across the top through the Transarctic Passageway. You'll notice that all three of those converge in the Bering Strait. And so this region of interest is particularly interest to understand what's happening now and how it will change in the future. Um, and currently, most transarctic shipping, and I would say almost all of it, and I, please correct me if I'm wrong during the Q&A, is limited to the northern sea route. And we expect that this transits along this passageway to continue to go, to grow, excuse me. Um, just this week, uh, the Chinese company Costco announced its intentions to continue sending uh, voyages through the northern sea route. Vessel activity through the Northwest Passage, through the Canadian archipelago, has largely been um, uh, dominated by uh, small uh, cruise ships, adventurers, and, um, and some large cruise ships as well. Um, and we, I anticipate that this pattern will continue, that there will not be a large amount of traffic going through the Northwest Passage, but there is one very large exception, and that is uh, relate, in relation to the Mary River, Mary River Mine in Baffinland, which is currently producing some of the world's highest quality iron ore. Last year, two ships sailed from this mine in Baffinland all the way across the northern sea route to deliver uh, these goods to, uh, uh, to Asia rather than go west uh, through the Northwest Passage. So there might be an opportunity in the next couple of years for vessels to take that route. And, and um, it sounds very easy to say, oh, there's shipments to and from and through the Arctic, but there are a lot of different kinds of vessel activities that don't fit neatly in these boxes, and including research, which I mentioned earlier, uh, is forcing us to reassess our opinion, our, our, our projections. Um, so this includes oceanographic research, activities related to oil and gas, and hydrographic surveys. There's also tourism, uh, and this goes from the single manned uh, sailing ships all the way up to the 980 uh, luxury cruise liner, Crystal Serenity, which passed through recently. Um, and there's also fishing, which Ambassador Bolton, I'm sure, can speak more to. Um, at present, commercial fishing is banned in the U.S. Ar uh, US waters north, uh, in the in the north of the Bering Strait and in the international waters above the, uh, the U.S. EEZ. But the marine environment is rapidly changing due to warming temperatures. And as fish move, I have no doubt that the fishermen will chase go behind. And finally, the last image I have for you here um, is to remind us that um, the oldest uh, the oldest type of vessel activity in the region is subsistence uh, harvesting. And so um, this is also probably the hardest vessel activity to monitor and track. Um, but I will say that there's over 160 registered whaling captains across the communities in our area of interest. And they're operating in much smaller vessels than uh, the, the big ships. And so this image here is actually from um, Canada, and it's a small fishing vessel next to a cargo ship coming from the Mary River Mine. Um, so in closing, I, and given the theme of this week of Infrastructure Week, I, I, I like to think of vessel activity and infrastructure as a chicken and egg. Um, vessels require a certain level of infrastructure to operate safely, but building that infrastructure, funding that infrastructure, justifying to the expenses, um, requires knowing what kind of traffic, how much traffic, when and where it will be. Um, and I, and I, and I want to say that this report that we're developing will hopefully answer some of the questions needed for folks that are uh, looking towards building infrastructure in the region. Um, and I also note that infrastructure means, uh, is, is, uh, includes things beyond the obvious. It's, it's not just icebreakers and deep draft ports. It's informational infrastructure, charts and communication systems, response services, and the people to power the whole system. Um, so if you're interested in this report, please contact arcticmts at cmts.gov. A draft will be released in June of this year, and a final report will be circulated and available on our website in uh, September. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> our next presenter is Sherry Goodman. Thank you very much, Helen and uh, Ambassador Bolton. And it's a pleasure and honor to be here with Mayor Benville. 
and Jeff and Sarah. That was an excellent presentation. I've now seen you present a couple of times, <laughs> and you're very comprehensive and thorough. So thank you for the excellent work you do. And thank you to the CMTS and to the many folks in the uh, Arctic uh, and transportation and maritime community that are here this morning. It's very important uh, work that you do and the interagency coordination, um, I, I really want to stress, I think is extremely important and a valuable service uh, that you provide both uh, in the public sector, academic sector, and in the private sector, all three being critical, um, critical efforts uh, um, in this time of building resilient Arctic infrastructure. So that's how I want to frame um, my remarks this morning to underscore some of the comments that have already been made and that I anticipate will be made. Let me start with a little bit of my own uh, personal uh, Arctic and Alaska history. Uh, as an aging cold warrior now, I first uh, went to Alaska in the early 90s when I was Deputy Undersecretary of Defense. Uh, and our mission at the time, reinforced very clearly by then Senator Ted Stevens, uh, who chaired the, uh, who, who was very senior member of the Defense Appropriations Committee and actually the father of DOD's Defense Environmental Restoration Program, was to take care of Alaska and clean up waste that had been left behind uh, from World War II activities in, in the state. And I know you probably well remember that, Mr. Mayor. Uh, everything from um, Barrel Bluffs at, uh, um, in, in coastal villages to um, a variety of locations, old dew line sites. Uh, and I did get to actually see the start of the Iditarod, my first trip to Alaska when I was pregnant with my daughter now 23, okay, so that was a few years ago. Uh, I didn't get up to Nome to see the end, but I did get to see it actually started that year in Anchorage, um, which I understand it doesn't so much anymore. Um, okay, so of course, and, and during that time, uh, end of the, you know, early post-Cold War period, we were working closely with the Russian and other military to help build down and denuclearize um, Russia and the former Soviet states. And I was leading a program called Arctic Military Environmental Cooperation in the 1990s with Russia, Norway, and a number of our other uh, Arctic partners. We even brought a delegation uh, of Russians and others to Alaska, to Galena, uh, to some other towns to see how we work cooperatively, and we were sharing a variety um, uh, of information. We were helping them build down their nuclear missiles and sharing how we do environmental management at military bases in Alaska and beyond. Okay, those days are long gone now, right? Uh, the world has changed. Uh, the Arctic has changed. Uh, very much so. It is you know, the place on our planet changing more rapidly than anywhere else. And you who live there know that better than anywhere else. Uh, and so I have deep respect for that and for the knowledge um, that you bring to understanding the region, both historically and as it changes now. And I think that is extremely important because as we look to the future um, to build a resilient Arctic and in this context for today, specifically resilient Arctic infrastructure. Um, I want to just make a couple of key points here because uh, we have a lot to discuss. First is um, <coughs> that we need to recognize that the way we have built infrastructure in the past can, has, to, has to, we have to use different standards now because as climate is changing, the design standards that we've used, historical projections about ocean temperatures, sea ice, uh, weather are no longer accurate. Okay, that's true everywhere in the world, but nowhere is it more true uh, than in Alaska. So we've been undertaking here at the Wilson Center with Sandia National Laboratories and the University of Alaska at Fairbanks over the last year, 
a project on resilient Arctic infrastructure better to understand and be able to prepare for helping design and engineer the type of infrastructure, whether it's a port, uh, whether it's other types of maritime and marine infrastructure that we will need to have. And in doing so, secondly, in an inclusive way, because resilience involves communities. Uh, resilience is not just about the built infrastructure, but it's also about the people who are living there and understanding and tapping into the local knowledge. Uh, and I think that's very critical. As part of our work last year, we even we, we did a specific workshop up uh, in Alaska better to understand that dimension and hear from local stakeholders. Um, third, often people who are not working specifically on Arctic all the time think that infrastructure in the U.S. part of the Arctic means either icebreakers or ports. And yes, it does mean both of those things, but I, I appreciate very much that Sarah underscored there's a lot more than that to infrastructure. Um, and we need to understand the communications infrastructure. And what I really want to stress is the research infrastructure that's going to be needed to better understand the rapidly changing Arctic and also in America's national security interest as we have to up our game in the Arctic, uh, as we have to be able to, to um, conduct um, a variety of operations and activities in the Arctic as it changes, we need to maintain the research, the science and research capability and have the infrastructure associated with the research in the high Arctic that's critically important. Uh, so I, I want to underscore that. And I saw there's a piece I, I wrote that uh, it ran in the hill this morning. You can pick it up outside about acknowledging um, that we need to both protect our national security and our environmental security interests in the, in the Arctic. Now, China, as you may know, released its first Arctic policy last year, and it declared itself a near-Arctic stakeholder. Um, not being an Arctic state, and has significant Arctic ambitions, including a polar silk road that will, ha as they help take advantage of all the different routes possibly available in the Arctic in that chart. But I think what's very critical, if you looked at that map, there might be three or more possible routes between the Northern Sea Route, the Northwest Passage, and the Central Arctic Route sometime in the future. But there's only one key choke point, and that's the Bering Strait. And that, I think, is something that we should, we all need to appreciate uh, because choke points become both critical areas of transit, they are critical opportunities, but also present additional risks. Um, and those are risks that we as a nation, uh, we as a maritime infrastructure community need to prepare for as we see the changes occurring um, in the region. And we have to do so both with infrastructure, um, with people, uh, with preparation uh, and understanding those range of risks, whether it's a search and rescue for a vessel that's run into trouble, run aground, or had an accident, uh, whether it's an oil spill. Uh, and I know there have been some exercises that the Coast Guards and the Arctic Coast Guard forums have run to do that and have revealed that, you no, know, there are a lot of challenges, there will be a lot of challenges if there is an oil spill uh, in that region. Or should there be something, uh, some unintended uh, missignals, miscues as um, the nations competing uh, for their national interests through Arctic activities uh, begin to, and hopefully that's, that's far away. Uh, the Arctic has been a zone of both cooperation and peace, uh, and, and, and we should do our best to do so, but we should also be very clear-eyed about the ambitions, uh, both economic and otherwise, of other nations as they see opportunities in the region. So I think that the fundamentals are being developed right here through this infrastructure collective, if you will, and I'm very pleased, <coughs> Helen, that you and the team are leading this, uh, that we have um, a great deal of uh, experience and history coming together on this, 
And I also want to thank uh, our team here. I see some of our friends from the Coast Guard who've worked very hard to put out uh, a new updated Coast Guard strategic. Uh, is it an outlook? Outlook. Okay, it's not a strategy. It's an outlook. <coughs> but the outlook looks in a clear-eyed way, uh, underscoring that the changing climate is changing our need uh, to increase and be able to operate in the Arctic. And you now see a variety of our uh, forces, naval, Coast Guard, and otherwise, um, preparing to be able to uh, both protect our national interests uh, in the region and also ensure a resilient future. With that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, one of the points that had made about talking about infrastructure, and I want to emphasize again, is that infrastructure isn't just brick and mortar. It is also informational infrastructure, which can include the charts and the maps, uh, the AIS information, the communications, um, all of which are uh, critical, uh, as well as what we consider traditional infrastructure projects. Our third speaker uh, is uh, Jeff San Juan. Thank you, Helen. Yep. Appreciate it. So I want to thank the CMTS for allowing Ada to be a part of the panel this morning, or yeah, still this morning, because uh, I'm four hours, I live in Alaska, so it's morning for me either way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thank you to Sarah for providing the update on um, just the overview of uh, information that CMTS provides. It's just phenomenal. And I really appreciate that our state is being looked at, because being in Alaska, you know, we all, we're sometimes forgotten. <laughs> Unless we hear about the, uh, just the Arctic and the changing climate, sometimes being a, being a state of just 60 years, so we're a young state. So 60 years, we don't have much infrastructure, as Sarah pointed out. We have one road going north <laughs> and south. We have no roads going east and no roads going west besides one going to the uh, to, to, through Canada. So we're really lacking infrastructure. And, and I really appreciate Sarah pointing out that um, many of our communities survive on fuel oil for energy. Mm -hmm. And about 25% of their incomes pay for basically electricity and heat. Up to 40% of their income goes to fuel uh, of energy, of fuel, oil, and heat uh, during, um, uh, during the winter in some of these places. So it's really expensive for many of these communities to be able to survive. And so when you're talking about infrastructure, it's really critical, you know, and, and um, as part of the Alaska Industrial De Development Export Authority, we see our role in helping facilitate and build infrastructure. And so this morning, I want to tell a little, about, a, a little bit about ADA and um, our mission and our tools that we've been given. So ADA's mission is to advance the economic growth and diversification of, in Alaska by providing various means of financing and investment. We're a semi-independent corporation of the state, managed by a seven-member board. We're self-funded, meaning we don't have any state appropriation. In fact, uh, over the past 20 years, ADA has provided the state legislature with over $400 million worth of dividends. So we've given $400 million ba back to the state. We have a S&P AA plus credit rating uh, that is independent of the state of Alaska. So the, I'm going to say, referred to as ADA, has a very healthy um, ecosystem and financial capacity to be able to build infrastructure. And so this morning, what I wanted to do was just kind of give you a few of the projects that ADA actually owns and has a 100% interest in. So the one I'm really going to talk about this morning, since we're talking about the Arctic, is our DeLong Mountain Transportation System, which is in the Northwest Arctic Borough. So it's in the top left corner. And that is the port, actually, I, I'm going to stay on the slide, but I'm going to show more pictures of that port in, in the next few slides. But the ADA has developed that port in 1989 with uh, Cominco, which is now Tech, as Sarah mentioned, to develop the road 
to go to the Red Dog Mine and a port to basically store and export the, the raw materials during the summer, summer months. And we've also owned assets as far as roads and ports on the North Slope. And we own a drill rig, well, we finance a drill rig in the Cook Inlet to, ex to really look for um, exporting uh, natural, uh, uh, oil and natural gas. One of our, we own the Ketchikan Shipyard, which builds mm -hmm. the ports, I mean, not the ports, which does shipbuilding. And we also own the Skagway Ore Terminal. So ADA was created in 1967 so that we can unlock the state's natural resources. So we've been given many tools to either invest in equity, finance it, bond it. Uh, with our credit rating, we can pretty much bond any project that is commercially viable. I, I do want to mention one thing, that ADA is not a granting authority. We're an investment firm. So we basically invest in commercial projects or industrial projects. Um, and we're also able to have a unique uh, opportunity to build infrastructure on DOD land. So the Camp Readiness Center is a, uh, a, a commercial building that houses the U.S. Coast Guard and the Air National Guard for Alaska. And that's built on Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson, which I, I always look, like to look at it as if you can build on Department of Defense land, you pretty much can build on any federal land or state land. So we have a great experience. So going back to DMTS, and as Sarah mentioned, um, I think the picture probably says a lot more about the Arctic during the winter. So when you look at this picture, this is our port and road that goes to the DMTS. It's frozen. <laughs> I actually uh, had some coworkers walk out on the Chuck GC as we were looking at it uh, April of probably two years ago. They said, I walked on the Chuck GC. So only in Alaska can you walk on water. <laughs> so I've, I haven't had the privilege of walking on the Chukchi Sea, but I did walk on the Bering Sea when it was frozen. So, so that helps. So you <coughs> see those two large containers on the left? With, it looks like the American flag. Mm -hmm. Those are the largest storage containers in North America. They house the zinc concentrate that has to be stored there on, you know, during the winter months, so that during the summer months, they can be exported. And if you look at all the storage containers on the right with the, for the fuel, actually this is probably a better picture. There you go. This is what it looks like during the summer months. So during the summer months, as Sarah mentioned, we're exporting zinc, and during the summer months, we're also importing all of our fuel. Well, not our fuel, but the Red Dog Mine fuel. And that's why we have to have all the storage tanks. Many of our communities have to have tanks like this to be able to store fuel to last them through the winter, which is very difficult. And going back to the winter months, every year, many of the communities, that's our infrastructure. It's the frozen lakes, frozen rivers. That's what gets them from one community to the next on snow machines. So that's the only way a lot of our Alaskan communities in the, in the Arctic travel to go visit their friends and families in the nearby communities. Either that or they have to fly. <laughs> so it's really expensive. And, oops. One of the things I wanted to mention was, you know, the, when, when uh, the Alaska legislature created ADA in 1967, them giving us the ability to, uh, they, they gave us every tool possible so that we can help build infrastructure. And that's one of the things that ADA is looking forward to as we build for the future. Because we really believe that there's a lot of opportunities in the state. The state as itself has about 90% of the natural resources needed for oil and gas, but even raw materials for building, uh, for building uh, m manufacturing goods and equipment. So we have rare earths, we have copper, we have zinc, we have gold. We have a lot of the commodities that Alaskan, uh, the U.S. businesses need to build and, and service goods. So we're really looking forward that as we build and develop infrastructure in the Arctic, it helps unlock our state. 
And last thing, if you look at the, all the colored areas, Alaska has so many different, we don't call them counties, we count them boroughs. So the shaded gray are, count, are boroughs that are not developed. So there's no formalized county or boroughs developed in there. So we're really trying to grow and develop communities and government at the same time. So we're really looking forward to building infrastructure so that our state can really make the impact which we were designed to make. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. And certainly, um, last but certainly um, not the least, is um, our friend, Mayor Benville. Thank you, Helen. Uh, what an honor to be here at the Wilson Center. Uh, I'm going to make a few comments that uh, Ambassador, oh, great one. Uh, I want to make a few comments that kind of paint on my background is theater. So I, I like scenery. I like backdrops. I like to give you uh, a, uh, a sense of, and it's really in often cases, a sense of drama about the very far north, as it's seen through the eyes of America, the United States. Um, I usually start by saying there are only two ways to get from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean by water in the Northern Hemisphere. They are the Panama Canal yep. and the Bering Strait. Now think about that. That's, that's huge. That's huge. The eight nations that share the Arctic territory uh, are, have been magically working together. The other thing that I want to mention that mentions that, that about those states is, as mayor, I've had the opportunity to travel a good deal to Norway, Greenland, Iceland, Sweden, Finland. My takeaway has always been the same. I grew up in the Air Force. My father was a dentist, so I'm, I'm a very much a military man. I'm very proud of our country. I lived through the Cold War. And I remember Winston, I believe it was Winston Churchill who said, if you don't learn from history, you're often doomed to repeat it. Mm. And I think about that in the back of my head. Uh, when I travel, my heart kind of is sad a little bit because when I'm in Tromso, I see that the Norwegians, the Swedes, the Finns, the Icelanders, the Greenlandic are not looking at the future. They are in it as we speak. And that, to me, is incredibly exciting. In the United States, thanks to the Wilson Center, thanks to the people here, thanks to you out there, Coast Guard, the word has slowly begun to get out to the American people. You can have all the government stuff you want, but it's the American people who have got to understand how important it is. Alaska, I love Alaska. I can brag on it forever. One of the things that I think is most fascinating about Alaska, this is my hero, but most fascinating about Alaska is the fact that the, Alaska contains more than half of the coastline of the United States of America. Now that's stunning. That's stunning. And a lot of that coastline, all of it in a way, and we also at Nome sits on, we're, we're in a perfect location. We're about 80 miles from the Bering Strait. Not just, you know, we're, we're east of Port Clarence, uh, which is a deep water port that will become a part of what is set, will become a, 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 a collection of infrastructure of different kinds going north because that's what the future holds. When I go to these countries, and we know the LNG uh, coming down to the, the, the northern route, uh, but then there are the interests of the Northwest Passage. This year in Nome, instead of having two or three small adventure cruise ships, we have 12. The Serenity came three years ago. There's a saying in tourism, and I know tourism because I'm in tourism, and that's what I do. I'm a tour guide. I'm a darn good one, too. Hello, Central. Um, that when you have, uh, it was so cute, I forgot what the hell I was going to say. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, if you can get there, people will go. They're selling tickets to, to get into the suborbital 
stuff. They want to go to the moon, right? It's our nature as a being to do that. I also live in a land, and Nome is a town of 3,850 people, 58% Alaska Native, in Yupiak, St. Lawrence Island, Yupik, and Yupik. And that's in a tremendous responsibility. Tremendous responsibility. Sarah, thank you for mentioning it so often because the, the, the involvement of Native people in their future, it's not just our future, it's their future. What we're doing in the far north now is the legacy of the young people of the far north and the legacy of the young people of the north. And with that goes the responsibility that is unbelievable. But I should brag a little more on Noam already. We were talking about resources and one, oil. We don't have so much oil. We got gold. Yeah, don't forget, we got gold. Uh, we have graphite right outside of Noam. Graphite. Graphite is being used experimentally to develop long-term batteries for it so that, that wind farms and solar farms can uh, hold and can save and use bank, if you will, electric uh, power and energy. That's important. And, uh, and we have uh, a wind farm in Nome. Katsubu has uh, a wind farm, and they, we have a lot of that. We have a lot of solar. Unfortunately, right now, solar, <laughs> solar only works in the summer <laughs> for reasons that are obvious. But they work. And we have the people of the far north. Nome has a seat, thanks to my predecessor, Denise Michaels, a seat on the Alaska Waterway Safety Committee, chaired by Willie Goodwin uh, out of, uh, out of uh, Kotzebue. That's an important and very interesting, not a lot of people know about it, because it's about helping to preserve the rights of subsistence hunters when they're out doing their subsistence work. We had a a, uh, uh, an exercise a couple of years ago. What happens if, and it was the same year, actually it was three years ago when Serenity went by, we were in Cots, uh, and, and it was about what happens if, you mentioned it, uh, Sarah, you mentioned it. It's very important to know to have the infrastructure to be able to handle it. But that can happen. It might very well happen. We got stuck a long time ago with the oil spill in Valdez. We're still talking about it. They still deal with some of the aftermath of that. But in today's world, we have an opportunity to work not just with the United States, which we need to do. We've got to get the rest of the U.S. behind us, build some of this infrastructure. A port in Nome makes sense. It makes sense. It's not a pie in the sky. It's not a build it and they will come. They're already coming. They're already coming. And back, I want to mention again, it's important with the native involvement in our area, in our region, in Alaska. It's so important. It's important everywhere. But I remember Melanie Banke, who's the president of, uh, of uh, uh, Sitnesak uh, Native Corporation. No, 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 no. Erase, erase, erase. Of Kowarik. And when President Obama was up and they were in Utpiavik and the comment was made to her about how nice it is to have you at our table. Well, <laughs> Melanie in her quiet way reminded him that, sir, it's not your table, it's our table. And it is. So I am very respectful of that. And we need to be. Because it is the involvement of the native people of Alaska that will push a lot of this forward because in, to be perfectly frank, they're not the only ones that can afford to build all the stuff sure. because of their entitlements, because of their resources, and because of their wisdom. In Barrow, Alaska, a man named, a man named Eben Hobson was able to see the future. This is before the development of Prudhoe Bay. And he saw what the development of Prudhoe Bay could do for his people, for the villages of the far north slope. And that's true in our part of the world, too. The vision of that empowerment, the vision of the wealth that is there and bringing it and getting it to the rest of the world and allowing the world to take part in it as well. There's very lot of interest from, from, from Korea 
We have a, I think next week, we have a research ship coming into, into port. And that's important too, research. NOAA, more or less, I don't want to say they home base there, but they're there a lot. The, the Coast Guard, my heroes, my hero, Shannon, my hero. And interestingly enough, I'm going to run, run, throw something at me, Helen, if I go too far. The, the Navy. I was at a symposium in Seattle about four or five years ago, and there was a very nice <laughs> naval admiral. And I said, Admiral, how come we don't see you in the far north? And he looked at me rather condescendingly and said, Mr. Mayor, we don't do the Arctic. Excuse me. Excuse me. We all do the Arctic. We are all involved with the Arctic. We are all, see the results in our daily lives of what happens in the Arctic. The trade, the politics, the diplomacy, the people, the lives, the culture, all so credibly important. Build a port in Nome, you bet. You bet. We're very close to it. I hope, <laughs> from my mouth to God's ears. We have a chief's report that will be ready in just under a year. Then it goes to Congress. Then we all hold our breath. Then we work. Because it's going to be expensive. But you know, smart progress is expensive. It has to be in order to be done correctly, in order to protect the resources, in order to protect a man hunting seals out on the ice, right? When we still get ice, although the Iditarod finishers went by my house, open water, as far as you could see. Open water in Nome, Alaska, in the dead of winter. It's a different world. But if you're out hunting seals, and you're standing over the blowhole, and you've got to stand motionless for hours because the sound will resonate through the ice and let the seals know you're there, which you don't want. And a big ship even miles away goes by and creates a wake, and that wake under the ice can knock you into the water. We don't think about that. The article of waterway safety is trying to protect way, and it worked. The communication between the land and Coast Guard allowed the serenity, direct contact with the land-based hunters to say, because the fall whaling was two months earlier than normal. Normal's not a word we use much up there anymore. Normal is what it is today, not necessarily what it'll be in 10 years or what it was 10 years ago. Railroads, communication, transportation, the International uh, Intercontinental Railway Company wants to dig a tunnel from Wales, the village of Wales, under the Bering Strait, and come up on the Russian side, connect with the Trans-Siberia Railroad, and there again is that thing that we do as a species. It's those connections. Those connections lead to progress. Those connections lead to a knowledge of, in the, in the sense of the responsibility to the people whose land. Yeah, we bought Alaska, but you don't buy souls. You don't buy intellect. You have control, but you don't have control. We work with, from my mouth to God's ears, the Alaska Native people to make all of these things happen because it's to their benefit. I was in education for many years. Those kids, that's their legacy. Mayor. Yes. Legacy. Shut up. No. No, no, no. We love your passion. Um, I, I want to stop you there because I think it's a great jumping off point to some Q&A. Sure. Um, and Dave, uh, Ambassador Bolton, if you could join us up here. My hero. <laughs> I thought I was your hero. You're all my hero. I think I've got heroes, heroes in every department. I think we're all heroes. Um, thank you so much for that. So let's give a, uh, since we applauded everybody, let's give the mayor. Thank you. So um, I appreciate the comments about the um, Alaska Natives. Um, I think everybody mentioned it um, in some form. So I'd like to ask the, start with a question on how can we, where are we in terms of uh, our partnerships, um, listening to, um, uh, uh, engaging with Alaska Natives 
are we doing enough, both on the federal side, so it's a very parochial question, but also um, how can we engage further to support um, and ensure that we're, per, you know, we're all kind of looking to the best uh, infrastructure to support um, the communities. Uh, Mayor, would you like to start? Um, I'm going to answer it in a way that might get me in trouble, but then I often am. Uh, it's, it's more than us working with them. I hate them, those. It works the other way, too. There has to be a desire within the Native community corporately yes. to work with the state, that's all of us, to do what is best for the country and Alaska. And Alaska. So I think we could do more as far as getting that communications. Dare I use the word trust? Dare I use the word trust? That we're not out to steal, rape, and pillage? that we're out to develop, build the resources, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a two-way street, absolutely. We need more. Jeff, yeah, thanks. Um, I welcome your experience. Um, you're in the middle of it. Uh, well, Helen, I appreciate that uh, question because Ada is really, we've developed a partnership with, you know, I, I say that Ada owns the DMTS port and road, but that is in partnership with NANA which is one of the 12 regional corporations uh, that was set up under uh, ANCSA. And, and uh, we do have some very great partners in, in Alaska when it comes to Native corporations. And Native corporations are unique in that the fact that, you know, they have an entrepreneurial spirit. They, they, they understand business. And, and even with our partnership with NANA, NANA owns the land that's under Red Dog. So they benefit greatly from the development of natural resources for that particular mine. Um, over $1 billion has been shared through NANA, through 7i and 7j, uh, to other regional corporations. And so when, when, when Alaska was created, they really did a great thing of being able to provide the native corporate, set up native corporations to be able to help them benefit economically. And so I think because of that, as the mayor mentioned, we have some very powerful and strong Alaska Native regional corporations. And there are some of our greatest assets in the state. And so I think uh, um, uh, uh, from, a, from a collaboration standpoint, Ada is really working with our Native corporations. Y there, there could always be more synergies because I think there's a lot of work not just wealth, but knowledge in the state, um, uh, as far as because we're so vast. You know, when I think of Alaska being double the size of Texas, <laughs> it's right. huge. You know, the, the mayor mentioned the mayor mentioned our coastline, but if you split Alaska in half, um, Texas would be the third largest state. So it's it's large, <laughs> and so our native corporations fill the whole area. So the the boroughs. There's native corporations all throughout the state because they really subdivided it. And I think in order for us to build infrastructure in the Arctic, we need to partner with ARSRC, mm -hmm. with NANA, mm -hmm. with Bristol Bay. Absolutely. So, so Ada has a connection with all those regional corporations. Thank you. Um, let me go back to um, the, the broader um, theme of today's event along with National Infrastructure Week. Um, and it is called Build for Tomorrow. So, um, um, I guess the, the question is, what does tomorrow look like? You dabbled in it, but what does it look like infrastructure-wise, or what is your vision? Um, 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 Sherry talked a little bit about the sustainable, the resilience part of it. Um, um, the mayor talked about um, in needing to engage the communities. Um, Sarah talked about some of the changes. Um, so what does it look like, and if we build it, will they come? But I heard they're already coming. So how do we... How to build for that tomorrow? Well, I think I think we have to be fearless, and I think we have to, do you know, in theater you say you get over yourself so you can perform, and sometimes the state of Alaska has to kind of work together to see the future and think outside the box. The rest of the world in the far north is thinking outside the box. We need to join, get on that train. And it's difficult sometimes because we're steeped in tradition thousands of years. Mm. 
thousands of years old. So it's difficult to bring that, and it's been a process, but it's happening. So I, I'm very positive about it. And we'll have refueling. We'll have also Nome's looking to expand its waste reception to satisfy polar code. Uh, so be taking, you know, the proper kinds of fuels in and getting rid of galley waste and get all of these different types of things. Uh, so there's, it's, it's happening, but it's, it's a slow go, and it's fraught with problems. I was just going to add, um, thinking about tomorrow, um, I think one of the things as I've been working on this project that's found been very helpful for me is actually reading a lot of sci-fi because building in the Arctic is almost like building on the moon and you have to think about m moving from the ground up. And and one of the things that I, you know, you can sort of close your eyes and, and imagine the future and I think about sort of the new industries that are nascent uh, elsewhere in Arctic environments, but are not yet in Alaska. So thinking like server farms, it's a, the, the cold temperature for now at least lends itself to that. But there's also the infrastructure that you would need to build that. And so how do you put the all the ducks in the right row, right order, so that you can actually have something that's a sustainable, productive industry um, and that also supports the communities that are there that already don't necessarily have the same kinds of infrastructure in place that we in the lower 48 have already. And, and so I definitely know I take for granted. Um, Ambassador Bolton, given your many, many years of working with the Arctic, as you look back and you kind of take that, the wholeness of your experience, where, where do you think we are? Um, and I guess I'm asking for a little bit of a federal engagement. I don't mean it as a loaded question, but um, uh, from your experience, um, where do you think we are? Where is it going? Well, that's, that's a harder question to answer today than it would have been half a year ago. Mm. Um, mostly since the end of the Cold War, the Arctic has been uh, a pretty peaceful, stable part of the world marked by a high degree of cooperation among countries. Um, conditions under which development of infrastructure might be optimal. Mm. Lately, um, some of that has, has been called into question. There is a sense uh, that security issues, which had not been much part of the um, discussion um, since the end of the Cold War, are reemerging. Um, you see lots of discussion about great power competition perhaps coming up into the Arctic. And I think part of our mission is to try to find a way to keep the Arctic the peaceful, stable, cooperative place it has been. Uh, and that will require uh, joining with our allies and partners, but also finding ways to deal with Russia and China that are um, both in our interests but can allow us to develop our part of the Arctic as we as we wish. I think that is possible, but there, is at there are at least questions about it today. I was dismayed at the outcome of the Arctic Council Ministerial. Mm -hmm. um, for the first time in its history, the Arctic Council did not reach agreement on a, uh, either on a bringing to fruition of projects that had been underway for two years or laying out a clear map for what is to come for the next two years. I think the Arctic Council will get past us, but it will require uh, thoughtful engagement on our part. I commend a piece that Cherry wrote about this uh, the other day that is out on the table outside if you want to um, hear a little bit more about that. Thank you. A uh, quick question for Sherry Goodman. Um, there's no doubt, though, that uh, investments made um, for security reasons, whether it's military or otherwise, can provide foundational um, infrastructure that could be used and built upon for other purposes. Where do you, do you think that that's how we are going to see investment in the short term? as to security requirements. Um, I guess this could anybody. And, and also, Jeff, you talked about the fact that you have um, uh, investments that are on, on military property. So if the military expands, um, or um, is, that a, is that kind of a, a way to get towards more infrastructure? Well, uh, look, our, our military has long had presence in the Arctic. It's just mostly been undersea or in the air, right? Um, and we've, uh, in recent years, um, even separate from the rapidly changing climate, we have been adding military infrastructure into Alaska and in the Arctic to counter uh, the missile threats 
from North Korea, China, Russia. So that piece of the military infrastructure has been expanding in recent years in Alaska. You know, additionally, right now what's happening is we're, um, as Secretary Mattis said last year, we need to up our game in the Arctic, which is we're increasing um, surface operations and training activities in the region, conducted a big Trident Juncture exercise in the North Atlantic. Um, there's ISEX exercises in, in Alaska. There are other sort of exercises where we're now seeing um, rebuilding capacities to train in the to train and conduct both land and sea activities in the Arctic, some of which had capability which was lost after the after the Cold War. For example, the Dew Line sites, many of them were dismantled, um, SOSIS, uh, sonar. So many of these capabilities that uh, have multiple purposes, right? And and uh, they can, and also I think what's really important is that the, the conditions, operating conditions need to be informed by local knowledge. And who has the local knowledge is the people who live there, right? It's not all available through remote sensing or other remote uh, applications. A lot of it has to come from knowledge on the ground, particularly when you're talking about real-time or near-time mm -hmm. operations. So I, th you know, I think that our um, military forces, for example, a very good example is what the National Guard is now doing. There's an Arctic interest group of the National Guard. We had them here about a year ago. They sat on the stage. Over uh, a dozen states are members of the Arctic uh, National Guard interest group, of course, led by Major General Lori Hummel of Alaska, mm -hmm. but many northern tier states in the U.S. are now, uh, you know, from New England to the Northern Plains states, want to train their National Guard um, personnel to be able to operate in cold weather conditions. And that's uh, being able to, you know, know what kind of equipment you, you need, what type of clothing you need. So there's a lot of work going on there that has to be informed by the local knowledge of operating conditions across a variety of dimensions. And I think that is a, an increasingly important partnership. It's a training opportunity at various levels of command uh, in various ways. And uh, I'm, that, that's a very positive uh, forward step. Jeff? So... You know, I, I think um, from a military standpoint, the um, what the DOD has done to move F-35 fighters over to um, uh, the interior has been really instrumental in really showing showing that uh, Alaska is a strategic location for being able to deploy troops, deploy uh, military, deploy uh, deploy uh, personnel. Um, and, and, and when I think back of even the, the earlier comment from the ambassador of even uh, our, our partners, the, a, lot of the, a lot of the uh, weapons that the military use to develop their weaponry um, require rare earths. And Alaska is one of the places that have rare earths, but the Chinese pretty much predominantly corner the market on rare earths. They, they corner the market on graphite. Uh, and so a lot of the resources are not being able to be developed economically because of the price changes. Um, I if they were economically viable, and we would be able to develop those natural resources or those resources to be able to develop weaponry in the United States. And, and I think that would be, that's part of the critical pieces of building out in the Arctic, uh, building out this infrastructure. Because if we built out the infrastructure, and we had uh, mining into graphite, mining into rare earths, and we have several rare earth uh, locations in the state. Uh, and so I think, you know, it, it just helps our military, it helps our nation get stronger because we're not dependent on raw materials from other countries. So that's one of the pieces I want to really emphasize that from a, from a health standpoint, if we don't, if, if we can lessen our dependence on other countries, for our natural, re for our resources to build weaponry, <laughs> magnets, um, lithium ion batteries. If we can develop that all in, in, in the United States, the better.
Thank you. A lot of opportunities in Alaska. Um, we'd like to go to the audience, uh, ask for questions. Um, Jaya has a microphone. It's incredible, uh, extremely important for benefit of those that are, are listening online that you speak into the microphone. Thank you. And if you could identify uh, who you are and your affiliation, please. <laughs> All right. My name is Leslie Canavera. I'm actually Yupik, and I'm from Alaska. Thank you, Mayor Benville, for talking about us like we're people. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm actually from Polartic. We're a small company. And uh, we recently attended the Arctic Economic Council in Rivomni also. Um, and it was really interesting because it was a lot about the infrastructure and responsible development. And the thing that we're trying to do for our company is do more of the informational infrastructure that you talked about. Mm -hmm. And a question I had was for governments and businesses currently, how do they do sea ice forecasts to be able to plan the logistics to be able to do kind of that infrastructure building? That sounds like a NOAA question. Uh, Sarah, you want to take a crack at that? Um, so so uh, that's a really great question. And I, n I am not an expert in this particular field. Um, and um, I know that the forecasts, they are working very hard to make those forecasts more accurate. Um, so be they're, they're more than five days out. Um, and there was a presentation um, as part of the Arctic Do Domain Awareness Meeting, or uh, Center, mm -hmm. excuse me, um, that's a partnership with, uh, through the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and there was a presentation talking about sea ice forecasts. But I, I'm not exactly sure um, how exactly things are progressing on that. I know that right now you only have a few days window to project. So project. So in my case, I'm trying to figure out what the sea ice is going to look like in 2030 at the end of my projection scenario. And there's not a really a good answer uh, for that. So um, models are getting better, but it's certainly a long way to go for the long-term planning. Because for infrastructure, you don't need what's going to happen in three days. You need what's going to happen in 30 years, um, especially if you have that integrated side with the shoreline infrastructure and you lose the shore fast ice and you have coastal erosion. If you're building something there and you're anticipating the shore, a shore fast ice is going to keep it in place during the winter months, it's a lot harder to predict. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. But if you find me afterwards, I know somebody in the audience who does. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Next question. Jaya? Thank you. Thank you very much for this remarkable presentation. I uh, just, it was very much needed and is mo more so. And your name and uh, affiliation, sorry. please? My name is Anita Parlow, and um, I was a Fulbright Fellow in Iceland and uh, Project Harvard MIT I worked with. And um, I just came back from China on the Arctic, um, Arctic, um, uh, sorry, Arctic Circle. Arctic Circle China meetings. I'm sorry, I'm total <laughs> jet lagged. And uh, to your points, I was stunned uh, by the breadth, depth, scope, uh, and uh, strategic thinking of what's going on in China mm -hmm. uh, with respect to the Polar Belt and Road and its relationship with Russia and the plans uh, with respect, particularly oil, gas, mining, uh, shipping, destinational shipping. Uh, moving from northern sea route to uh, Asia, China, and, and both ways back, obviously going through the Bering. And uh, the amount of infrastructure that's being built uh, and dual use, uh, much of it, and people getting very nervous about, uh, I'm not giving a lecture, I promise, um, people getting very nervous about how to characterize this and what does it mean for the United States. And, uh, um, and there were some who thought um, that uh, it was very good for the United States. It's more activity, more action going back and forth commercially. And if the United States is not the moving force, as General Matter said, as somebody pointed out, we need to up our game in the Arctic. Um, how does the U.S. integrate in or uh, look at the dynamics that are going on without viewing it in Cold War terms, dare I say? And, um, uh, and, and what does this mean? Uh, so one is a national level question, and then the Alaska question in terms of infrastructure. Uh, what does that mean in terms of drawing some of that uh, traffic? And uh, from last point, uh, question, pointed part of the question, uh, from research done, it doesn't look really like bulk uh, containers are going to be going up and down the bearing. Um, it's not going to replace Suez. It's not going to replace Panama. They're going to be huger. They're going to require uh, some of them autonomous, requiring mm -hmm. smart ports. Uh, et cetera. So where do we fit into all this as we're thinking in terms of infrastructure development, 
for the next 10, 20, 30 years, and including the security uh, dimension as well, not to leave that part. Thank out. you. Maybe we could work backwards with that question. And Sarah, could you um, uh, just kind of answer briefly your observations about the types of vessel activity that you're seeing and where there's growth or, d or a decrease? Absolutely. Um, so. So I, I agree with you that um, the the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal, they're not going to close in the next decade and be totally replaced by Arctic shipping lanes. I, I don't see in the next 10 years more uh, trans-Arctic passages happening. It's all going to be happening on the Northern Sea Route is what my best guess is. And looking forward at ice models to your early, to the other earlier question, it, it seems like the, the shipping across the top, that's not necessarily going to something that's going to happen before 2040. There might be a couple of, of sort of test runs, like we saw with Maersk going across the Northern Sea Route with a container uh, ship. Um, so you'll have that attempt, that try to see if it goes. But um, at this point in time, um, it's, it's not a, a, a totally going to replace. But you might have, even if you get, you know, 5% of several thousand ships, that's still a huge footprint in, a, in an area that doesn't have as much vessel activity as the rest of the world. Um, is there other? Um, yeah, thank you. No, perfect. Um, Can I it, add on? It, would you like to add on? And maybe someone would like to, the ambassador would like to talk about the non-Cold War question. Yeah. So l let me underscore what you just brought back from China, you know, your observations there that, you know, they are preparing for a different Arctic future. Um, and we need to be aware of that. They're not necessarily, China isn't necessarily doing it to oppose us, but it has, it has economic and natural interest plans of their own. They take the long game, they're strategic in their thinking and their planning and their global investments. But are they going to invest in Alaska? Well, they have been, you know, saying? the premier has been to Alaska offering, offering to help do, you know, provide the direct foreign direct investment to uh, bring LNG from Nome to uh, the lower 48. So, and and they've increased significantly their foreign direct investment in Greenland and in Iceland. And uh, you know that has that has significant strategic implications for the U.S. Uh, you know, yes, we've pushed back on some of that uh, in Greenland, and uh, you know, so we're aware of the national security implications of that, and 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 following that. On the the question before on the um, sea ice forecasting, there was an interesting hearing yesterday um, uh, with NOAA witnesses, academic and, and private sector uh, witnesses on improving the weather forecasting in the weather enterprise. Um, and it was not an Arctic hearing. It was a general sort of weather enterprise hearing and a recognition that there are a variety of ways in which we need to overall improve our weather forecasting. Research to operations is a sort of big piece of it. There's a lot of effort underway now to sort of advance the public-private partnerships that will enable the research uh, from NOAA and through academic partners better to be translated into commercial products that are available to address more near-term solutions for a variety of users' needs, industries, um, whether it's infrastructure builders, real estate developers, and others. And I think that is slowly coming together. It needs more nurturing. Um, uh, I'm going to just, yeah, if I can, ahead. just to tra if we could go, Ambassador Bolton, um, could you elaborate on the, uh, well, the question about China? Sure. I think, um, Anita, part of what you're saying suggests a concern I've heard from others, namely that China will use its economic prowess to obtain or attain undue influence over decisions uh, made by the Arctic countries individually or collectively. Of course, this is a concern that might be voiced about China's influence elsewhere. And one thing about the Arctic is that um, there are eight fairly wealthy countries. I think Chinese use of their economic leverage in places like Africa, Latin America, perhaps other places in Asia might even be um, a bigger issue. That said, uh, this bears watching, um, and I do think we need to be vigilant. Thank you. Another question, please. Uh, Peter Humphrey, intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. I note that uh, 
there's going to be a lot of Russian ports opening up all along their coast, and those are going to be funded largely by China. And that's an interesting dynamic mm -hmm. to see what China can, uh, can threaten Russia if it has disagreements in that regard. My question concerns uh, something called methane clathrates. I've been to a dozen of these conferences, and not once has this been mentioned. This is an immense, absolutely huge, frozen gas resource that sits in the continental shelves of all the cold areas. And when it's brought out of the cold and up, uh, up to the surface, it, is, it turns into gas. Um, without a doubt, this is a, a resource we're going to use. And when you're talking about 20, 30, or 30 years out, it is definitely within that time frame. And yet not one of the people on the 12 panels I attended even bothers to bring it up. So this is a huge infrastructure demand, too, when these uh, frozen balls start coming up. Mm. Uh, do you turn them into gas at the north coast of Alaska and then create a gas pipeline uh, to the markets? What kinds of things? And also that mining operation, that clathrate mining operation, is going to interfere with uh, the reconstruction of the SOSIS network, which I'm very concerned about. Well, I believe there will be some mention of it in the uh, upcoming report that Sarah mentioned. But do you want to elaborate? Yeah, so um, I actually studied oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico, which also has methane hydrates. So I'm, or uh, clathrates. Um, so I, and this is a question I raised at our workshop that we had um, to inform the report that I'm working on. Um, because it is, like you said, there's, there's immense amounts of this natural resource trapped um, uh, on the sea floor, held at uh, pressure and temperature. Um, however, as far as I understand, in the next 10 to 20 years, it is not necessarily a viable industry. So we need more R&D on that side of things in order to make it viable. Um, I'll also say from an environmental standpoint that those, um, those are actually scaffolds for an immense amount of sea life as well. And so when we talk about industry and, and harvesting those, we also have to think about the environmental impacts um, how, how it will be there in 20, 30 years when the technology is available, what, what those communities will look like remains to be seen. But certainly I think it feeds into your question or your comment earlier, Sherry, about research. And so the R&D infrastructure to, to, to get to those resources and, and harvest them responsibly is something um, that, that we certainly will be thinking about in the future. And the mechanism of research is so important, as is the mechanism of how do you run a port and a series of ports. Port authority is a word that you or phrase we're hearing more and more. But what you were just talking about is so important because we're, we think <laughs> as a, we're so good, but we aren't, the research hasn't been done. You talk about rare earth. It's, it's huge, it's huge. And we need to do that more. And the methane thing I find absolutely blows me away. I just can't, but to use a phrase, I, you know, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's huge. Good so, point. Well, I'm afraid we're almost out of time, so I, I think a few of us can stick around um, if you have questions after. So please let me um, make the notation that um, we at the CMTS do want to um, be available to our stakeholders. We know a lot of folks in government, and you may not need us to find somebody key in government, but don't hesitate to contact us at any time. Uh, as a one-stop shop to get you to the right people. Um, and please vid us, visit um, our reports on the Arctic at www.cmts.gov. Um, uh, Ambassador, did you want to mention anything about the Ice Diminishing Conference uh, in July? Yeah, um, in, uh, I don't have the dates in front of me. Maybe you have them, Helen, but uh, we are partnering once again uh, with um, the um, uh, U.S. Arctic Research Committee, uh, Commission and others uh, to put on a... And yes, and, and others, mm -hmm. uh, to put on an event on um, the uh, effects of an ice-diminished Arctic. It will take place in uh, mid-July, a couple of days. Um, stay tuned for more. Yeah, so please go on the Wilson um, Center site. Thank you so much for all of you being here today and those of us who are watching online. Thank you to our speakers. Let's give them one more round of applause. Thank you.